Hey right there. Welcome back. This is the next video. This is the third, third video I'm recording today. This one's going to be on personal jurisdiction. I'm going to try to make it as quick as I reasonably can, considering that I have an awful lot of videos online about personal jurisdiction. I'll look for my videos on the YouTube site for PJ Big Picture Day. Uh, when you look that up, look for the most recent one, because I record it every year, which I go exhaustively through on uh, personal jurisdiction, as my one else know. Uh, nonetheless, I think it's important that you guys get at least a brief um, review of personal jurisdiction. And what you can do is go on my website, uh, go to my PJ materials uh, in the MBE Review set Center, and you'll find this coggle. Now, it, what the coggle is, is a, uh, a scalable interactive flowchart. You can zoom in and out and move around and all of that, which is my conceptualization of how to analyze a personal jurisdiction problem. And it's, it's kind of thorough and hopefully helpful. The first big question you always have to ask yourself when analyzing personal jurisdiction in any court, state or federal, is what court are you in? Are you in a federal court or a state court? Let's start with federal court. Next question you have to ask yourself in federal court is, jurisdiction over what? Is it property or is it person? All right. If it's property, then we're analyzing Rule 4N, which I'm really not going to get into. Okay. 4N is likely not going to be tested on the bar. But in essence, the most fact pattern is going to then tell you to go over and look for the corresponding state law. Okay. See if state law authorizes the uh, assertion of property, and does the federal constitution permit the attachment or seizure of the property? More interesting and testable is what about jurisdiction in persona over the person in federal court, right? And here we're looking at rule 4K. Now 4K has a number of bases for jurisdiction. Can you read that okay? All right. The main one is section 4K1A which essentially says there can be jurisdiction over the person in federal court if the corresponding state court would also have impersonal jurisdiction. Okay? That means you, we would then turn to the state long-arm statute plus 14th Amendment due process. We'll get back to that. There are several bases in federal court for impersonal jurisdiction that are only in federal court, and that's because federal courts are limited not by the 14th Amendment, but by the 5th which in theory would permit nationwide PJ. Therefore, sometimes you can get PJ in federal court that wouldn't be possible in state court. So, 4K1B is the bulge rule. If they were going to be sneaky, they could definitely test you uh, on the bulge rule. And the way the bulge rule looks, let me see if I have a hypo. I think I have a hypo here I can sh share with you. There we go. did this one with my 1Ls earlier. Imagine there's an accident between a plaintiff and a driver in Tallahassee, all right? Plaintiff sues the driver in federal court in Tallahassee. And imagine the driver is like, ay, 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 ay. Even if I was negligent, I just had that car repaired in Georgia at a repair shop, okay? And whatever that repair shop did, contributed to the accident, or owes me indemnification for the accident, okay? And therefore, what the driver does is uses Rule 14 to plead the repair shop, saying, hey, repair shop, anything I driver owe the plaintiff, you owe me in whole or in part, okay? So that's a little bit of a review of Joyner right there. How's that for tying in today's class, guys? We just did Rule 14. Now, the repair shop isn't in... Um, Florida, it's in Georgia. Let's imagine that it advertises locally. It's got no contacts with Florida, right? Under the normal international shoe test, there's no jurisdiction over the repair shop, the Georgia repair shop in Florida. Ah! But the bulge rule. The bulge rule says that you can bulge out a federal district. In other words, if the defendant is served, within 100 miles of the federal courthouse, within a U.S. federal district, and they were joined under Rule 14 third party, or Rule 19 required joinder, then there's PJ over them. 
See, that's possible only in federal court. So this would be an example of the bulge rule. You see the circle I've drawn around the courthouse, about 100 miles from Tallahassee? That reaches and bulges out into Georgia. And therefore, there would be PJ, not under international shoe, but instead under the bulge rule. Now, imagine if instead of being served there within a district in Georgia, the owner of the repair shop was served out in international waters out in the Gulf of Mexico, right? Then there's no bulge rule jurisdiction because you have to be served in a federal judicial district. So the elements here, service in a federal judicial district, one. Within 100 miles of the federal courthouse, two. And the person against whom PJ is asserted was joined under Rule 14 or 19. Three. That's tricky and that's testable. You see, what I'm trying to go at here with is, is in your studies for the MBE, try to think of things that make for a like clean multiple choice questions, right? If something involves a lot of standards, it's harder to do a multiple choice. Now, as Dean Singer will point out to you, she and I can both come up with a good multiple choice question that, that, come, that involves standards, then you might see questions like, which of these is the best answer? Or what is the plaintiff's best argument, right? That's where standards might come in more easily. Dean Singer, am, am I, you're the expert here on the multiple choices. Is what I'm saying here helpful or fair? Yeah. Okay. So, but I think this is testable because it, it, it's very uh, uh, kind of rule base. Now going back to the cobble here, here's another basis for PJ that almost certainly not going to come up. When there's a specialized statute that permits PJ, right? For example, statutory interpleader. It allows nationwide personal jurisdiction as long as the defendant is served anywhere in the United States in the federal judicial district. That's an example of 4K1C. Finally, there's 4K2, long arm, a federal long arm jurisdiction. That means there must be a federal question cause of action, say like copyright or federal employment discrimination, not negligence, not breach of contract. Uh, a second, um, there can't be 4K1A jurisdiction in any state court. So in other words, 4K2, federal long arm, acts as kind of a, 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 a um, what's the word, a um, fallback 4K1A jurisdiction. If this is satisfied in any state, then you can't use 4K2. So, claim arises under federal law, no 4K1A jurisdiction, and finally, PJ doesn't violate the Fifth Amendment. In other words, that's usually understood to mean that the defendant has nationwide minimum contacts. Here's a defendant against who was held to have nationwide minimum contacts, Osama bin Laden. Seriously, there's, there's a, a District of D.C. court that used 4K2 to find um, um, long-arm jurisdiction under 4K2 against Osama bin Laden. So there's an example of that. Well, that's if you're in federal court. Now, let's get to the biggie here. Remember I said under 4K1A, in federal court, we analyze in personam jurisdiction the same way the corresponding state court would, right? Long arm plus due process. Well, let's move over here and see how state court would do in personam jurisdiction. Well, the first step for in personam is to look at the state long arm statute, okay? Now, if you're going to be tested on the state long arm statute, then the fact pattern must provide you with the long arm, because each state has different long arm statutes. Some are unenumerated. They'll say something like, PJ is okay to the full uh, breadth authorized by the uh, due process clause of the Constitution of the United States, right? In which case, the constitutional analysis and long arm statute analysis kind of collapse into one analysis. However, some of them are enumerated, okay? They'll specify a laundry list of bases for personal jurisdiction. Then you're going to have to like sink your teeth into the long arm and start thinking of arguments you can make one way um, or another. My guess is that you're probably not going to see that. The second step after you look at the long arm is to analyze 14th Amendment due process. Okay, that's referring to the the, the, the prohibition on taking away somebody's uh, life, liberty, or property without due process. And that can be satisfied through either traditional bases or the modern basis of minimum contacts. Traditional bases, there's a whole bunch. For example, domicile, where somebody resides with the intent, generally speaking, to remain indefinitely, right? 
Well, they're subject to PJ in that place. It's their home. I'm domiciled in Florida, so I can be sued in Florida for anything, right? A car accident in Alaska, uh, a bar fight in, in Brazil. I can be sued in Florida for all those things, all right? Consent and waiver, I kind of think of them all together. Consent are things you do to mean there's PJ. For example, you sign a contract that has a forum selection clause, right? I can send to jurisdiction in whatever place, right? Or you have a written stipulation or in-court stipulation saying we stipulate the jurisdiction is appropriate, right? Consent, you do something. Waiver, you fail to do something which has the legal effect of you losing the right to object to PJ, right? In other words, you sued in Alaska for something that happened in Florida, and guess what you forget to do? You forget to object to PJ. You serve your answer on the, on the plaintiff, oh, and you forget to object to PJ. Oh, so sad, too bad. Um, generally speaking, you waived uh, PJ, subject to Rule 15A1, of course, right? So you waive your objection. Again, a traditional basis. Something more complex is tag jurisdiction. I suspect that you won't be tested in the MBE on the complexities of tag jurisdiction because in, in the Burnham case, the Supreme Court split, uh, unable to come up with a legal explanation for when and whether tag jurisdiction is appropriate. You remember that case where Mr. Dennis Burnham was divorcing, was getting divorced from his wife, and he goes out to California to visit his kids and do some business. He takes his daughter uh, for a couple days, I think it was to Los Angeles or San Francisco, and when he takes the young girl back home, he's served with papers, right? The question is, is whether that tag being served personally with papers is enough for PJ. And a number of justices, but not five, held the tag is traditional, tag is historical, tag is still good, without looking at minimum context. Uh, Brennan, with three other justices, says, no, you gotta look at minimum context, but Brennan thought three days in the state was enough. The current state of the law, in my opinion, is in flux for a lot of really interesting jurisprudential issues that that my one else had to endure for at least a whole class that I'm not going to repeat with you guys today. Suffice it to say, and in my opinion, if you get tested on uh, the tag rule, things they're more likely to look at is, why was the defendant in the state? Were we there voluntarily, or were they tricked into going to the state? Because under the doctrine of fraudulent inducement, tag jurisdiction shouldn't matter if you were tricked into going to the state, right? That's testable. Here's something else that's testable. Tag jurisdiction, if applicable, only works when an individual human is, is served personally, right? So say I sue Walmart, okay? And I achieve service on Walmart by serving the CEO of Walmart in Florida while he's on vacation down here, or she's on vacation down here, right? Well, that'll satisfy the requirement for service, but that won't establish tag jurisdiction over Walmart because Walmart is a corporation. No tag jurisdiction over corporations. Tag jurisdiction is only for uh, humans and also for partnerships, okay, but not for corporations. So I'm gonna, gonna save you the, the, the interesting discussion of Burnham and be happy to talk to you about it outside of this session. Or just look at my uh, PJ Big Picture Day video. Now, if you don't have a, a traditional basis for PJ, then you can go to the minimal contacts test, right? Right? The minimum contacts test is looking at the relationship between uh, the, the defendant and the forum and the plaintiff's claim, right? So you always want to think about the extent of the contacts. Are they singular, isolated? Uh, are they extensive? Are they systematic and continuous, right? And what's the relationship? Did those contacts give rise to the claim? Now let me, having said that, look at it more systematically. Uh, general jurisdiction is all-purpose jurisdiction. That's when the contacts the defendant has with the state have no relationship uh, to the suit. That would be, for example, uh, you know, I get into an accident in Florida with an Alaskan citizen. An Alaskan citizen, he sues me in Alaska, right? Trouble is, is, well, that's a bad example. Here's a better example. Okay. I'm from Florida, I live in Florida, I get in an accident in Florida with somebody from Alaska. 
month later, I decide to go on a cruise to Alaska. And I get off at Anchorage and I'll be bopping around and rock around. Oh, this is great. Look at that. Hey, there's Sarah Pellet. Oh, this is really nice. <laughs> right? And then all of a sudden, you know, Tommy Lee Jones comes up to me, you know, like from the, from the movie, the, uh, what was that movie called? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> the Harrison Ford. You know, he hunts people down. Nice. Yeah, you're Professor Davidson? Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> and he hands me the papers and says, you can serve. I just go off on a tangent. <laughs> See, that's what happens when I'm having too much fun. <clears throat> well, then that would be a tag jurisdiction hypo. I just did it, did it, did you not solve it? All right, let's rewind a minute. Let me get my voice back. All right, so, accident in Florida. I'm sued by the plaintiff in Alaska. I go to Alaska on vacation, and I come home. But I'm not served in Alaska. So I had to fix the hypo. I was having too much fun with Tommy Lee Jones. Do I have a contact with Alaska? My vacation? Yes. I do have a contact. Is there any connection between my vacation in Alaska and the lawsuit? No, uh, no right? Because the, the accident was in Florida. You see what I'm getting at? It would be unfair to have me have PJ in Alaska based on my contact in Alaska. That's why general jurisdiction is known as all-purpose jurisdiction. It's when the contacts don't give rise to the claim. The contacts are unrelated to the claim. And it would be unfair for me to be subject to jurisdiction in Alaska for something that happened in Florida unless my contacts with Alaska were so pervasive that I was like at home in Alaska, right? So let's flip the hypothetical. Suppose I'm in Alaska. Okay, and I get into an accident while I'm in Alaska on that vacation. Then I go home to Florida, and the guy from Alaska sues me in Florida for the Alaskan accident. Does that seem unfair? Yeah, why? Why? You're right. Why is it? Why is it completely fair for me to be sued in Florida for an accident that happens in Alaska? Because it's where I'm at home. So for there to be all-purpose jurisdiction. You've got to have really extensive context. Why? Why? Because the context didn't give rise to the claim. The context aren't related to the claim. But it's okay constitutionally because in terms of the Supreme Court, your contacts are so systematic and continuous that you, that you as a defendant are essentially at home in that forum state. Now I'm building up state. All right. So systematic and continuous and essentially at home. In the Goodyear and in the Daimler case, the Supreme Court said that normally for corporation, that's going to be two places. Any place where it's incorporated and its principal place of business, okay? Uh, second, for individuals, it's typically going to be where they are domiciled, okay? Uh, the court had a kind of escape clause in footnote 19 of the case and said in exceptional cases there can be other places, but I, I think that's going to take a really exceptional strong case where there's some other place where you're still really at home. So you're not going to have general or all-purpose jurisdiction over a person or a company unless it's their place of domicile, place of incorporation, the principal place of business, or some other place that's so similar to those other places the defendant's essentially at home. It's really hard to satisfy general jurisdiction these days. Much easier to satisfy is specific jurisdiction. All right, Specific jurisdiction can arise with lots of contacts or even with just one contact. What you need to know is whether or not the defendant's contacts gave rise to the claim and the exercise of jurisdiction would be reasonable. So it's a three-part analysis. Part one is the defendant has purposefully availed itself of the benefits and protection of the state's laws. Second, the contacts gave rise to the claim. Third, it would be reasonable to exercise jurisdiction. Let's go through each of them briefly. Purposeful availment means there's a quid pro quo. The defendant has intentionally or purposefully done something that creates a contact with the state. It could be by going there, it could be by soliciting business there, it could be by shipping products there, it could be by driving there, it could be by a remote intentional tort that knowingly and intentionally causes a harm, with that harm felt there, okay? You have to actually reach out to that, that state with some purposefulness. The idea here is a quid pro quo. By reaching out to the state, the defendant 
gets benefits and protection to the state's laws. Say I solicit you in the state of Georgia and say, hey, why don't you subscribe to my website for 10 bucks a month and I'll send you um, personal jurisdiction problems. That's how wonderful is that? And you agree, right? Well, if you agree to pay me 10 bucks a month and you don't pay it, I can sue you in Georgia, right? I get the be I reach out to Georgia, I got benefits. Weekly so, if I welch on the contract or I don't perform and you want to sue me, isn't it quid pro quo fair that I should be also sued in the state that I reached out to that I got benefits from, right? That's the gist of purposeful availment. And all this stuff up here are just different ways of satisfying purposeful availment. A contract. Negligence, you drive to the state and run into a car there, right? Um, an intentional tort like in Calder and Walden. You also have stream of commerce, right? And that's potentially testable. The problem here is the court is split, but I can imagine the, the, the test makers easily coming up with a factual scenario that requires you to know the difference between the Brennan, uh, the uh, uh, O'Connor, and the, uh, uh, the uh, Stevens approaches to stream of commerce. Stream, Supreme Court has never decided when stream of commerce test is satisfied or not. In other words, what kind of conduct is enough to show purposeful development by stream of commerce? The stream of commerce is when goods, either a component, a part of a product, or the finished product itself, is sent from the place of manufacture, through a chain of distribution, to the final place where it's sold and then causes injury. Like in Asahi itself, right? A, a valve made in Asia is shipped elsewhere in Asia or goes into a tube, eventually goes into a tire, eventually goes into a motorcycle tire, which eventually ends up in a motorcycle in California where the tire or the tube or the um, 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 a valve go bad and cause a horrifying accident for, for Gary Zerker and his wife. Okay? And the question is, is whether that stream of commerce from Asia to California is purposeful development. Well, Justice Brennan said, well, as long as there's a regular and anticipated flow of the goods from the place of manufacture to the place of sale, and the defendant's aware that they're being marketed in that state, that's enough. Right? That's purposeful of it. Justice O'Connor said, no, 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 no. I think that in addition to what Brennan wants, we want to have something showing the defendant purposefully directed itself to the forum state. Some sort of plus factor, such as advertising aimed at the forum state. Designing the product for the forum state. Setting up channels of advice giving in the forum state. Uh, hiring sales agents for the forum state. So she disagreed. She had wanted to hire sh showing, showing more than the awareness that the goods you make in Asia are going to be sold in California. Okay? Stevens gave another test, which is less likely to be tested on. He looks for the volume, value, and hazardous nature of the goods. Bottom line is the Supreme Court has never resolved this split. They tried about, I don't know, six, seven, eight years ago in the DeCastro case. They still haven't resolved this. So keep this split in mind uh, when you get to the bar exam. If you have purposeful availment, and purposeful availment is always required for specific jurisdiction, then you ask whether the contacts uh, gave rise to the claim. Okay? That second step looks at the relationship between the purposeful availment contacts and the claim. And uh, courts have varying approaches. One is to look, ask whether or not, but for the contacts, there would never have been a claim, right? So say I send a solicitation from Florida to California saying, come and visit me in Florida, come and stay at my resort on Miami Beach, right? And then you receive the solicitation in California, and because of this, you come to my resort in Florida, okay? And while you're in Florida, you slip on a banana peel and you fall and you hurt yourself. Well, you didn't fall and hurt yourself because of the solicitation, but on the other hand, but for the solicitation going to California, you never would have come here in the first place, you see? So therefore, I reached out to California, and but for that contact with California, you never would have come to Florida to get hurt. So I have contact with California that gave rise to a claim. Right? The evidence test instead asks, are the contacts themselves evidence of the claim? Right. So say again, I'm sued in California for the slip and fall in Florida. First step, do I have a contact with, with, with California? Yes, I sent a solicitation there. Next step, under the evidence test, is the solicitation sent to California evidence of a slip and fall that happened in Florida? And the answer here would probably be a no. 
The evidence used for the slip and fall would be what happened in Florida, right? So depending on what test you use would determine whether or not those collect tax gave rise to the claim. You want to know more about the facts, but in essence, but four asks, is the contact part of the chain of events that led to the claim? The evidence test asks whether the contacts themselves are evidence of the claim. Assuming you meet step one and step two, namely purposeful availment and the context given rise to a claim, you again go to the reasonableness factors and first you need to keep in mind that under Burger King, once uh, a purposeful availment is shown, we presume reasonableness and the defendant has the burden of showing a compelling case of unreasonableness. It's very hard for the defendant to do this. We look at five factors. How burdensome is it on the defendant to go to the forum state and litigate there? What interest do the plaintiffs have in litigating the forum state? Does the forum state have interests in having the case heard there? Judicial efficiency. Would it be efficient to have the case in the forum state in light of where the bulk of the witnesses and evidence are? And finally, uh, substantive social policy, which asks, would the social policies underlying the claim mean that this is a good place to have the lawsuit? Do the various states and countries involved believe that this cause of action is one that's worth hearing? Okay, so that's specific jurisdiction. For PJ, what we've done here is we've so far talked about property in federal court, persons in federal court, which usually requires you to come over here in state court to do in personam. The last thing we'll talk about briefly is jurisdiction over property in state court. And this I don't want to talk to too briefly because I think that it's not likely to be talked about too much in the bar exam because of some uncertainties in the law. If you're in state court and property is being, is being sued, first you have to look to state law. Does state law permit this seizure, right? So for example, is there a state statute or rule dealing with garnishment or seizure or execution or something like that? If there is, then we look to 14th Amendment due process. And here in the Schaffer case, Justice Marshall said that we need to use the minimum context framework for all assertions of jurisdiction over property. Okay? And here he was looking to the relationship between the property and the lawsuit. In other words, in my, my words, whether there's specific or general jurisdiction. Now I'm going to note two things to you very briefly, and note one third thing, and then I'm going to end this personal jurisdiction discussion. The first thing, very briefly, is in the opinion, Marshall himself talks about the distinction between in rem and quasi in rem jurisdiction. In rem is when the property is being sued and the whole world is bound. Usually there's going to be jurisdiction there because the property is itself the subject matter of the suit. In other words, the property is related to the suit, right? Gave rise to the claim. In a quasi in rem type one, it's just between the litigants, but the property is again at issue. For instance, it's a contract for the sale of property, the seller doesn't want to close, and the buyer is trying to force a closing, right? So we're trying to figure out who gets the property, and it's only us litigants that are bound, but the property gave rise to the claim. Again, Marshall says usually there's going to be PJ just based on the presence of the property in the state. Where it gets harder is in quasi rev type 2, 2A and 2B. 2A would be you own a vacation home in Alaska, Okay, and somebody has a slip and fall out front because it's icy, it's Alaska, and you weren't cleaning your property, right? Well, there, when they sue you for negligence, they're not suing over ownership of the property. But in a sense, the property is related to the claim, right? Here, Marshall said, maybe there's jurisdiction. But finally, what if there's no relationship at all between the property and the claim? So say you get into a bar fight in Florida with an Alaskan resident. The Alaska resident goes back to Alaska and files a lawsuit against your vacation home under a quasi and rem suit, right? It wants to sue your house as a way of securing a judgment and establishing jurisdiction over your property in Alaska. Well, here Marshall says, hey, where the property is completely unrelated to the lawsuit, there's not going to be any jurisdiction over the property without more context. So that's the first thing to say about property. The second thing to say about property is this. There's a handout that I have on the site that you might find to be helpful. It's a handout on Schaffer's treatment of in rem. And I have both of these on the website. Look on the website for it. If you can't find it, let me know. I'd be glad to send you the link. 
all right? I have these handouts on the website which go into further details, so I don't have to go into it here because I think it's a level of complexity that I'm not so sure it's testing. The last thing I'll say about property and about PJ is there's some concurrences in Schaffer that say, well, if the property at issue is real property, maybe we want to have jurisdiction over it because the property is in the forum state and not even worry about the contacts or about the minimum contacts framework. In other words, these concurrences said, for example, if there's real estate, real property in a state, that perhaps there should always be in rem or quasi in rem jurisdiction over it, regardless of a lack of a relationship between the property and the suit. So that issue is kind of still out there. Don't think it's likely to be tested. That's it for personal jurisdiction. Let me stop the camera and we'll move into another issue in a moment.